afternoon, everyone. I would like to begin by acknowledging the traditional custodian of the land we meet today and pay my respect to their elder, past, and present. I extend that respect to Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples. Then I pay my special respect to all the four fallen heroes from Spring Revolution in Myanmar. I also thank this AMI seminar presenter, Dr. Tong Shui and Sophia Tui. I appreciate all our participants from different part of the world for joining the AMI seminar today. Our AMI president, Nicholas Koppel, will open the meeting. Nicholas, the floor is yours. Good evening, everybody. Tonight, we will begin by showing the video of a talk National Unity Government Foreign Minister Zinmar Ang gave during her recent visit to Melbourne. Not all of you would have been able to uh, join her for that, for that um, presentation. And uh, also what she had to say, I think, bears uh, repeating and, and listening to a second time. So I, I've heard it a th at least three times now, and uh, each time you, you, well, maybe it's me, but each time I get something more out of it. So it, it's a good uh, opportunity to hear it again. But also we'll be joined by uh, a couple of um, speakers today, uh, in particular Dr. Tunang Shui, the NUG representative here in Australia, who after the um, playing of uh, the minister's speech, um, will be able to make some remarks and take some questions. And also, uh, as May mentioned, uh, Sophia Tway, who will Sophie Tway, who will um, uh, give her perspective on things as well. So perhaps um, without further ado, sorry, we should all, we'll also be taking questions at the end as well um, for people who who, who have them. Um, May, would you like to to start screening the video now? Thank you so much uh, for your kind introductions. Uh, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. And um, I also would like to thank uh, indigenous elders, distinguished guests and uh, students and our also Burmese community to be here with us. And thank you for inviting me to contribute uh, to this University of Melbourne Initiative for Peace Building and Myanmar Research Network. So it is an honor to be here in person because I, I used to join online uh, uh, discussions uh, in the past, but uh, this is my first time in person to be here and to share some reflections uh, on the Spring Revolution and voices of civil resistance in Myanmar, uh, which is pushing the, the Myanmar's future. Civil resistance movement have been a constant feature of Myanmar's journey to democratization. So I'm proud to be part of the resistance movement that has opposed in opposing and will defeat the unlawful military coup that has assailed my country of Myanmar. I see the resilience, which is the defining feature of the people of Myanmar against the unlawful coup that took place in February 2021. In the early weeks after the coup, the people of our cities, our villages, and countryside stand up with one voice. They says no and call for civil disobedience movement to reject military rule. This rejection is, and uh, this rejection was and still in a nationwide rejection coming from all social and professional groups, civil servants, medical workers, teachers, even female textile factory workers and rural workers to, took streets uh, to protest attempted, we still call attempted military coup. 60% of civil disobedience movement are women. The rejections of coup was also a generational uprising of our teenagers and students of our Generation Z. 
half of Myanmar's population is under the age of 30. They have seen promising future for themselves during our democratic transition and they have been and still are determined not to let military take that future away from them. The people of my country rejected attempted coup with non-violence protest and civil disobedience, which lasted for months, but military scaled up brutality by killing and armed protesters and by arresting and torturing thousands of them. The first protester to be shot and killed while participating in a peaceful demonstration was a 19-year-old woman, soon followed by many others. So we know that freedom is not free. Many uh, indeed pay with their lives. There are many and sent heroes. Neymar has seen murders, executions, and rape. There is too much death, too much suffering imposed on the people by the hunter. We face um, the choice to either succumb to Myanmar's ugly dictatorships or to defend ourselves and our belief in a better future, a future in which the people are sovereign. People of my country decided to defend itself against military terror. That was not a decision of one or another political leadership groups. That was collective decisions of the whole nation. It is now in our third year fighting the military hunter and continued efforts to restore Myanmar's democratic path. One of the important lessons I have learned is that it is not enough to acknowledge what is wrong in the country. We need to address what is the right way for the future of Myanmar. That is why we have intensely discussed a man, CRPH, representing representative of the um, elected member of parliament, ethnic revolutionary forces, political parties, and lay out federal democracy charter before national unity government has been found. We need to take action to make sure we set and implement policy that address the root causes of the gates of civil resistance. Now, after three years, we, along with our ethnic alliance and revolutionary forces, are expanding the territories under revolutionary control, diminishing the influence of hunter forces. We are building new alliance across the ethnic groups in our country. We are delivering humanitarian assistance, health care, and education to the people at this time of great need. We have found common purpose in this cause. My country has suffered deep divisions in the past. Ethnicity and religions have been used by the military leaders to divide and so to rule. Now, ethnic political parties and civil society are also collaborating in a resistance with the purpose. This revolution is actually different from previous resistance to military coups. This is in part because we have tasted freedom. In 2025 and in 2020, we held election in my country these were not perfect, but they were judged to be free and fair by the international community. So empowered in part also by the social media and new forms of debate. These were elections where the voices of Yang were heard clearly. 
Ours is a revolution of young people who demand a better future, as I said before, and who can connect with each other in the new ways. That is why the militaries are targeting young people with special hatred. Schools are targeted for their rockets and their guns. They think nothing of the mother of children and they are threatening young people by activating false conscription law. They want further for the war that they are losing. This will only create more resistance for sure and the greater revolution. The young people of Myanmar were not allowed military rule to endure. This revolution is also different because this is the last coup that we will suffer. All of us opposed to the hunter agree this. In the past, ethnic, uh, ethnic resistance groups fought to protect their territory. But now they are expanding their engagement to take control of more of Myanmar as the hunters retreats. These losers are significant and are amplified by the defections from the military. Then, what is our cause? It is the freedom of Myanmar and the creations of a federal democratic country where all can live in peace. This requires the eradication of military dictatorships and it means replacing our broken constitution with one in which that places the military under civilian control. It means creating an inclusive and federal democratic union in which power belongs to our states and regions and to the people. Our struggle is against the gate of systemic and structural violence by the so-called Tamador, we call military. They have infiltrated every structure of Myanmar in their evil desire to hold power, to exploit Myanmar resources for their own gain, and to subjugate our people as slaves to their desire. The future of Myanmar will be federal and it will be democratic. It is the future in which the rights of all are respected, in which the cause of ethnic discriminations is lifted from our lands. This is the work that our national unity government is undertaking already now in partnership with our ethnic alliance and with community and civil society groups in a shared process. This is hard work. We have many decades of mistrust that we must face truthfully. We are mindful in these discussions of the burdens of suffering borne by many ethnic communities and in a particularly terrible will by the Rohingya people. The voluntary, dignified, and permanent return of the Rohingya to Myanmar is essential to the work of bringing peace and reconciliation to our country. So too is the work to repeal those military laws and that are racist in intent. Right now, we are accelerating our political efforts. Maybe you might notice that on January 31st, 2024, we have announced a new common framework for our future with six core objectives which emboldened in principle of federal democracy charter. First one is to overturn the usurpations of state power by the military and to terminate the involvement of the armed forces in politics. And the second, to ensure that all armed forces operate solely under the command of a civilian government elected through democratic process. And the third, to abrogate the constitutions of 2008 in its entirely and to, to quash all attempts to reinstate its provision. Fourth, to draft and promulgate a new constitution that embodies federalism and democratic values 
garnering the consensus of all relevant parties. And the fifth, to establish a new Federal Democratic Union in accordance with the proposed Federal Democratic Constitution. And the seventh and the last, to institute a system of transition adjusted in order to address and remedy the injustice inflicted upon innocent party throughout the conflict. Ladies and gentlemen, we must do this for the military hunter is close to collapse. We are focusing on civilian protection, on human security, and on building local governance in area and our revolutionary control. The development of and the interim constitution and constitutional arrangements for transition adjusted politics, economy, social services, and uh, rehabilitations are all part of our comprehensive plan for a post-revolutionary Myanmar. People of my country has found deeper reservoirs of courage to defend and protect our rights, our freedoms, and our future. Why we are acutely aware of the many areas needing for improvement, we also constantly reminded that ours is a gradual process and that achieving consensus in our large, diverse, and inclusive coalitions require genuine consultations. We acknowledge that inclusions and representations of women and minorities remain a major challenge calling for our serious seriousness about democratic participation and equal representation. Despite our own shortcomings, we are confident that our commitment to bringing about democratic change and establishing a federal union should not be dubbed. It's already three years. Democratic countries have not found courage to recognize, enough courage, I say, to recognize our struggle and to assist us. I understand that Myanmar people feel that their struggles and um, democratic aspirations are completely overlooked, ignored, and left alone. Myanmar might look like as far away country about which democratic countries know little and have no national interest there. However, we are big nations of 55 million people. We are a country with gas, oil, and abundance of rare materials. We are huge fertile lands, which used to be one of the rice baskets of the world. We are placed between India and China as the only corridor for China to India oceans. If our country will become pirate military dictatorships, which has been resituated to live by the authoritarian alliance, it will become obvious how big loss we are for the other democratic countries. We will continue our struggle and we will not be defeated. We will prevail at the end but this struggle will last much longer and it will be much more destructive and tragic if we will continue to be overlooked and ignored. So today, I would like to ask you, especially friends of democracy from across the world and here in Australia, gather in the country that has known a dark past to recognize our resilient and hear our genuine attention to build a new Myanmar. And we need help in this work. And this is not the time to let authoritarian alliance help one more criminally murderous dictatorship prevail. This is our cause. And in Myanmar, democracy can win, especially in 2024. This is the time for Myanmar to be free. And thank you so much for your attention. Thank you.
Before we uh, invite uh, Gareth to, to share some remarks, we might have some time for Q&A. Uh, we could have two or three questions for Dozim Ma Ong. And if you could keep them to brief questions, that would be wonderful. So I, I invite you now, as you take a moment, <laughs> to Uh, hello, uh, my name is Fedi Hadiz. Uh, I'm from uh, Southeast Asia as well. I'm from Indonesia. <laughs> I'm the director of the Asia Institute here at the University of Melbourne. Uh, my question uh, deals with uh, the Rohingya. So as we know, uh, what happened to the Rohingya uh, didn't uh, occur on the watch of the military junta. Uh, during the watch of the previous democratically elected government. So uh, wh why would the Rohingya actually uh, believe in uh, the sorts of uh, uh, more conciliatory uh, uh, statements that you have made where there would be a place for the Rohingya in a democratic and federal Myanmar given the recent experiences that they've had? Thank you, Vedi. And I'll take another uh, one or two questions. Yeah, thank you. Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm Lin from, uh, I study, I just completed my master of course here uh, in Melbourne University. Um, my question is, um, there in recent time, there is a, a wars of war on social media between NUJ and uh, AA, back and forth. Uh, if you can uh, talk about talk about it a little bit, or if you don't feel that it's not important, then you can just leave. It. Thank you. Um, my name is Peggy. I'm a, a Burmese ascendant. Um, I got a question is the NUG and EAOs, all the EAOs and PDF, are you getting along together in one um, uh, unity? Because if we are one unity and if we are getting all, all ethnic, and then, then you we can talk to China because our neighbor China and uh, India and Thailand, especially China, we should talk uh, to the uh, how we are, you know, a unity. And then because now this we we are uh, getting together, and then and and then the other thing is we can ask the China is a, you want a short term or long term. You know, so we are the long term uh, uh, benefit to China and the stabilities and um, all, all the benefits for them. So that, that is one I just want to ask is we are all together. Thanks. Thank you. Are you happy to respond? Yeah, is your mic? Oh. Yeah, thank you. Um, thank you so much. Uh, I will go through the first questions on on Rohingya. Uh, yes, of course, the, uh, the issue related to Rohingya is actually a sign uh, mentioned in my statement. It is uh, in our country, the entire population is suffering uh, systematic uh, uh, oppressions and discriminations against not just only the Rohingya, but also others, minorities, even the majority are now suffering a lot. So that is why we addressed system change is really needed to be addressed not just only focusing on one ethnicity, one identity, but also multiple identity as so multi-ethnic states, multi-religious and multi-cultural multi states. So that is why I said very strongly, and I do believe that uh, Rohingya populations and identity should be part of our future Myanmar uh, to represent the multi-ethnic and multi-religious 
states. So in this regard, um, before and after coup, the perceptions of even the society is totally changed. It is also very important because sometimes democratic government used to look at their voters, majorities. But at the same time, the military junta and military extremist group, I will say, are using the religious as a tool to undermine the role of the democratic leaderships by using religious and ethnic issues. So it is very difficult even for us to address outrightly during the time of the, uh, uh, for example, like elections. So it is very important now for us. We are very much cautiously and carefully approach this issue to address in the right way. And we are quite uh, aware of and stick into the recommendations of the Mr. Kofi Annan Commission's report uh, to address that issue in the uh, in currently and in the future. And of course, the role of the uh, Arakan peoples uh, is also very important. So we are we have the same kind of discussions with the Arakan army on this issue, and we need to listen both community, the voices of the both community, uh, in terms of living peacefully together um, in the Arakan states. And now on the other hand, I would like to go through to the uh, NUG and AA. Uh, this is not just, uh, I, what I see is that in terms of uh, our statement, especially what is happening in, in Arakan state, uh, Rakhine state, uh, from our official position as an NUG, we do not make any dispute or argument or debate with the Arakan army, publicly or privately. We do respect their perspective and their opinion. So this is the way we approach. But at the same time, we also need to stick on our own principle. So this is uh, uh, I, uh, the response I would like to uh, make. And another, the last uh, question is about uh, China and our unified voices, I will say. Yes, of course, we do have um, uh, the bilateral, multilateral relationship with our ethnic uh, resistance organizations. Some ethnic resistance organizations are very openly engaged with us, but some ethnic uh, AMS organizations are not their visibility is very limited because it is a balancing between their uh, like alliance and their, their relationship with China and neighboring countries. On the other hand, China itself is very cautious to engage with us publicly. But we are trying to um, deliver our message publicly, both publicly and privately. The revolutions, the victory, and our victory will definitely bring their victory. Their victory is, you know, they would like to do more economy in, in stable, stable, if there is no stability in our country, we cannot guarantee. None of the political actors or groups will not be guaranteed if there is no democratic government, especially under those uh, uh, military rule. Even military themselves will not be able to guarantee. It is what's happening now. That is why what we are trying to do, the future of Myanmar will definitely guarantee both the interests of Myanmar and and China and our neighboring country, and not just only the China and India and neighboring country, but also, I will say to the international community, but also for the regional stability. Our, our cause will definitely deliver stability in our border and stability in our region in sustainable way. If not, our concern is that if international community approach in shock at that will not bring sustainable peace. There is no shock at 
to sustainable peace. So that is what we are uh, fighting for. This is what we are struggling for. And our message is very clear. Uh, we, we are very much take care of our neighboring countries and their interests and their consent. And also, they also, you, they also need to respect the will of the people and the voice of the people of Myanmar. Thank you. Thank you for those questions and thank you, Dozima Ong, for those responses. Oh, thank you. That's, uh, we'll leave our recording there and uh, open it up uh, to our two presenters. Uh, the first one, as I mentioned at the outset, is Dr. Tunang Shui, who um, I'll introduce you to him, although he probably doesn't need much of an introduction to this audience as he's a, a familiar figure in the scene in here on the AMI webinars, but also right throughout Australia. Uh, Dr. Tunang Shui is the representative of Myanmar's National Unity Government here in Australia, and he took up that role in July of 2021. He's a graduate in medicine from the, Univer from the University of Medicine in Yangon, on, but also from the University of Economics in Yangon and the University of New South Wales. He was a general practitioner in, in Myanmar, working in local communities for 10 years in Kachin State, and then moved to the non-profit humanitarian sector um, and worked for a number of different projects and programs in Myanmar. He came to Australia for further study and um, in the areas of public health and health management in some 16 years ago, and uh, is currently undertaking doctoral studies at the University of New South Wales in the area of peace, conflict, and social cohesion. Our second uh, commentator today is uh, Sophia Tway. And she is a PhD candidate at the University of Melbourne School of Social and Political Science. Her doctoral research examines local-led peacebuilding approaches in the context of ongoing Rohingya conflict uh, in Myanmar. Uh, in addition to her research, she also lectures in development studies at the university. She is holding a master's degree in international community development from Victoria University. Uh, so here in Melbourne, and ga has gained significant experience beyond academia. Before pursuing her PhD, she actively engaged as a practitioner and researcher uh, with international and local organisations in Myanmar and other regions, encompassing various aspects of development, peace building, and humanitarian efforts. So we're very delighted to have uh, both those two people today to provide some commentary, but also to um, help me in answering some of the questions which might come from our online audience. But perhaps I'll begin, uh, Dr. Tunang Shui, with perhaps um, if you could give us a broad indication of what uh, uh, the Minister's objectives were for her visit to Australia. This was her first visit since uh, taking on that role, and also the outcomes of her visit. Thank you, Nicholas. Can, can you hear me? Hello. Yes. Oh, thank you. Uh, yeah, this is the first visit of the Dozema to Australia and then also the first in person meeting with the foreign minister of in Canberra. So, how this is really important in the mindset of the NUG during this struggle because he was able to explain what is happening in Myanmar from the ethnic organization point of view, NUG point of view, and also she's also the founder of the CRPH. So she also explained the situation for the lawmaker point of view. And all, she also delivered uh, speeches at the four uh, Australian University, University of Queensland, ENU, uh, and then the University of Sydney and Melbourne. So I would like to summarize what she presented at the various occasion. There are uh, seven key important points. The first one is the context of the revolution. And the second one is the, the commitment of the Myanmar Spring Revolution, commitment of the NUG, CRPs, ERUs, and the general population. The third one is the common goal of the Myanmar Spring Revolution today. And then fourth one is the achievement of the revolution today. And then finally, she presented about 
<clears throat> the future plan and then it's the art international community as well as the Australian government and parliamentarians to support the cause. So in terms of uh, context, she clearly highlighted that the Myanmar Spring Revolution is very unique and quite different to previous ones because she pointed that the revolution is a unified nationwide rejection of the rejection of the military coup. A second, people in Myanmar, they already tasted the democracy and the democratic government system in the past five years. That is quite different with the previous uh, revolutions. And also she highlighted that the role of women and youth. So women, young <coughs> women, all age of the women and all the young generation, they are taking part in the revolution with a very significant role at, the, at, at all stages, at all corners. So logistic, fundraising, and even the women, they participate in the military wing of the NUG, the PDO. And secondly, she highlighted about the commitment of the Myanmar Spring Revolution. The first commitment is the federal visions and then the restoration of the democracy in Myanmar. Second thing is they're building the new alliance. So you can see Dozema already mentioned that there are uh, different groups of EROs. They engage the revolution in their own way. Some EROs, they express their engagement willingly in the public space. But some ERO, they, do not, they didn't ex expose their engagement with NUG, but they are collaborating and showing their engagement in some way. And some ERO, they didn't show any engagement, but they are participating in a different way. So that is a, and also she highlighted about the inclusion of the Rohingya issue in the NUG agenda, the Green Revolution agenda. The third one is a common goal establishment of the federal union. So she highlighted the formation of the CRPH and NUG and also the federal military charter. And lastly, she clearly highlighted about the importance of the, the joint political statement released on the 31st January uh, 2024 this year. And finally, she explained about the achievement regarding the ethnic unity, dialogue and collaboration Territorial control, increasing territorial control, form foundation of the new states, and then the intramessures and transitional justice. These are the key elements that we achieve today. And, and then finally, she requests international communities, especially the democratic uh, democratic countries, to be united because she. Compare with the autocratic regimes on the wall. So autocratic regimes are very united and supporting Myanmar military junta. But on the other hand, the democratic forces are not like this. So she asked democratic countries to unite and then the support for the cops. So these are the things she highlighted throughout her speeches, including the Myanmar University. Thank you. Nicholas, I, I would like to express for the moment, I would like to stop here and then I will join this. Thank you. <laughs> um, well, maybe I should bring you in uh, now, Sophia. Um, I noticed um, that, the, that the minister is, I mean, well, let me go back a step. A lot of the commentary, particularly coming out of the West, talks about the restoration of democracy as if it's about going back to the past. But in the minister's uh, language, she talks very much more about it being a revolution. We heard her use that word quite often. And that it's a movement, a revolutionary movement to create a new federal democratic union. And I was wondering, um, particularly you with your background in, in peace studies and peacemaking, is um, how, how you view that. I mean, she's essentially saying this is something we need to fight for and conquer to achieve this change rather than it being some a peace which we can negotiate with it, with, with the Tatmadaw. Um, it's a big question, but I was wondering if you've got a perspective on that. Yeah. 
Thank you, Nicholas. Um, this really good questions and yes, a big questions. I think in my past studies, like Minister said, like you know, like this is revolutions and this is like the end game. And she also mentioned that this is the last aku we're going to suffer in her speech. I think um uh, I just would like to highlight it, you know, like the, 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 the whole revolution is not only we're fighting against the dictatorship, but also like since we started the coup in 2021, we have seen that so many social changes also happened, like, you know, so many levels. So like, <clears throat> of course, this is revolution time and we fight against the system systematic uh change and and also on the same time at the community level like you know like social change and like you know uh, also the minister mentioned that um and that the perspective or the um you know majority of Bambi's group changed towards the ethnic minority groups including the Rohingya as we have seen that throughout this like revolution there's a lot of these kind of changes also like gender equality you know like there's a lot of changes is actually happening and so at some time like um in some time like the, also like scholars and international um I, I get activists they also highlighted like this is the revolution is not only bringing the changes at the political top level but also bringing the ground level and like all these like changes happening because like as we have seen in Myanmar that religious like minister said like religious is has been used as a tool like you know to divide different ethnic groups and ethnic religions but right now what we have seen is so many people they have more sympathy sympathetic towards others and because we have seen that this is have been propaganda and this is also a kind of eye-opening opportunity for everyone who are not only these like you know like top level elite groups but also even like rural area from the you know Ampa Myanmar for example in my hometown in my village I'm actually from between Sakai and Sakai regions and the Kachin state and my hometown no one really know about human rights and they had never heard of that concept and when you go and talk to them they were never mentioning what is a human rights they don't know what is this like you know equality they may not know what is a democracy they may not know but Right now, and I can even imagine, and you know, back in three years ago, when you go and talk to these people, do you want democracy? Maybe they may not say anything like they want democracy or not. But right now, everyone in my village and also the whole region, like they are getting involved in this revolution. I think that is because like, like Minister and Dr. Tuan she said, like we already face a uh, taste of the freedom. I also see that not only that we taste the freedom, we also have this opportunity to see the how ingested and you know ongoing injustice happening ongoing in Myanmar and the people had like more opportunity to collaborate with different groups and to learn from a lot of a lot of things. So um that's actually is um yeah this is challenging time and we have a lot of people a lot of sacrifice and a lot of suffering but we also have a lot of opportunities you know, like going, looking back, looking forward to the future. There's a lot of these, like Minister said, a lot of these um, ethnic um, group uh, <coughs> making alliances. <coughs> so in our group, the Burmese group, uh, Burmese language discussion before the minister, the speech at the seminar, I had the opportunity uh, to to uh, facilitate the roundtable discussion in Burmese language with the minister. We also have this really meaningful discussion, what she, um, mostly about this, you know, like the unity and also the um, peace building, especially the making alliances between different EAO and, and UG. And so in that conversation, Minister even said that, um, yeah, of course, it was really challenging to be, to, to have a trust between different ethnic groups and also with NUG. But compared to 2021 and 2024, we they have seen a lot of changes, especially trust building. I think trust building is the 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 most essential stuff that we need in Myanmar, especially for the democracy and democratic society, and in order to be peace building society, we need the trust building issue. So also drawing back to 
in my own research and when I do a lot of the um, interview and why this conflict happened, tensions and divided society, I, and they all mentioned that these ethnic and groups leaders, they all mentioned that the reason is they were not able to collaborate different groups because of the trust issues. So I think that NUG somehow uh, like um, already See, uh, they are already trying to establish trust with the different angles. Uh, also, even with our army, they also have a lot of the positive relationship. And so, which is, I think, also a good sign before, because before these, uh, before even the coup in the previous government and the Arakan army, they really had these, like, you know, negative relationships and they were fighting against and a lot of issues. So, I think that's like, like to, to go back to your answer and also covering at other uh, Dr. Tronshi and the minister said, I think, yeah, we had a lot of challenges, like minister also mentioned in our group discussion in Burmese language. Also a lot of challenges because of the, like there's a lot of the, like, like emerging issues are coming up through the revolution. And sometimes it's, they do, the NUG have, like do not have the resources to address all the issues, but, but slowly and gradually they are addressing the issues and that is one thing and UG wanted to wanted the international community understand and what that is what they really need to support to NUG as well. Because sometimes we are like, oh, what is NUG position on the regarding the Rohingya issue? Like so many people are interested in, I mean, including myself, interested in what is position, what is their policy? But on the same time, and the NUCC, they all already are discussing like, you know, like regarding NU, uh, Rohingya policy, how they're going to address address the issue. I mean, they already thought thought throughout, but they need more time to process and implement. So I think that, um, yeah, there's a lot of opportunity uh, for all us. And I mean, like, this is already three years and some people feel like maybe uh, we are not, uh, we, we haven't achieved that what we wanted to achieve, but somehow I felt like despite the challenges and, and UG and especially the people of Myanmar, civil, uh, civil, uh, civilians, like they have strong resilience and they are fighting until today. I mean, looking back to 2021, I attend to the, some of the academic workshops and conferences. Most of the academic and, you know, international analysts, they will usually say that, Oh, like you know, the military is going to win, and this these movement, like civilly and resistant movement, it were going to crash down anytime soon. But obviously, that is wrong, and the, we have been already three years, and and stay and you, uh, I mean, like the revolutionary groups are winning, and a lot of territory controls, and a lot of the local governance and happening on the ground, and also obviously, military is not winning. So there's a lot of these um strong the um, commitment like you know coming from the the young people younger generations and like ministers that we had these um very strong um you know like a uh, reason to believe that this is this the end game um i'm actually one of the person very positive and optimistic so i think that is anytime so we are going to do win this revolutions and yeah um despite the challenges, yeah, of course, yeah. Thank you, Nicholas, for the question. Thank you, and um, uh, it's interesting to see you're, you're very much focused on it as a revolution as well, which I think is the way most, um, most people in Myanmar, but particularly young people in Myanmar, are seeing it. Uh, Dr. Tunang Shui, I was wondering if, um, if you're at liberty to tell us um, who... Uh, Minister Zinmar Ang met with at, in in the Australian government, and um, what was asked of the Australian government, and whether and what the response was from the Australian government. Oh, thank you, Nicola. So, Dr. Zinmar Ang met as he up anyone, the foreign minister of the Australian government, as well as the key uh, parliamentarians who are responsible who are looking after the Australian foreign policy and also very much interested in the yeah. issue. And also she met with the senior officer of the UK, as well as the some diplomatic uh, community in Canberra. Yeah, and then we're telling the city that anyone, 
Do we have a very frank discussion regarding the Australian role and commitment for restoration of democracy and protecting human rights and how the Australian government can do for Myanmar? So we, we discussed about the section member as well as community assistance, as well as uh, parallel state building, supporting, uh, the, you know, the Myanmar revolution is, uh, in this revolution, the one of the critical elements is, is the conflict transformation, the building the new institution, building the uh, administrative mechanism, administrative department, not only at the federal level, the new chief, but also at the, the federal unit level, the remaining state, executive council, uh, PNLE, the uh, Liberation Army, and as well as other. ERO. They are also uh, trying to uh, build up their their administrative capacity and then building the institution. So there are so many uh, institutional transformation and buildings are happening in Myanmar. And uh, we had a discussion about that issue, how the government can contribute this uh, transformation process. And also they discussed about the regional matter. So Australian government look at the Myanmar situation as a, a threat to the regional security and peace, to a regional lands. So that is why Australian government keep as a centrality, as a policy, and then the approach to Myanmar issue to ASEAN. So in that sense, President Mao also uh, explained and request Australian government to do more in the region, not only uh, behind the ASEAN, but also take own initiative. So they yeah, they really have a really good discussion and then and the two identifying, you know, the ASEAN community is very diverse. And some ASEAN member states are quite in line with what Myanmar people want and some are not. So yeah, I don't know if anyone applies to our to approach and work closely with the people, like minded countries in the ASEAN region. And the ASEAN government also have a other uh, bilateral uh, discussion and tools and for the Myanmar cause. So that is their intended uh, discussion. Uh, uh, thank you for that. So she was um, very happy with, with what she heard in, in Canberra, or I'm not sure, of, well, in Australia, I should say. Yeah, yeah, she, she really liked our visit. And then she think that her visit is uh, very productive. And then, <clears throat> and she also loved the Myanmar diaspora community, unity, and then strength and uh, supporting the cause, as well as the, the parliamentarians. We, we have a really, really deep discussion on how uh, the parliament can contribute and work for the restoration of human rights and democracy in Myanmar. So there will be the follow up attitude and engagement between CRPs and Australian Parliament as well as the, between the two governments. Right. We have a question that's coming online and um, the question is, what will the end of the junta look like? Would you be able to um, look into the crystal ball and give your perspective on what the end of the junta might look like? Are you asking me? Yes. For, for the, uh, okay, so Junta is now struggling for the survival. That's my, my frank opinion. So, since independence, Myanmar military doesn't face this kind of struggle today. So, you may know the northern, uh, northeastern Komen is now uh, occupied by the uh, our allied forces, led by the MNDA. And also, the Western Command is now under, uh, under serious threat of the Arakan Army and Allied forces, as well as in Mandalay, the second largest city of Myanmar. The democratic forces are now reaching nearly 20 miles from the Mandalay city. So that is a military attempt. In terms of political development, the NUT, ERO, 
they are closely working and then exploring and negotiating for building of the Federal Democratic Union. So in the last 70 years, this actor, they didn't get to discuss in that uh, in that level, as well as the practice. So in these days, all the actors, they are not only discussing the federal principle, but also they are practicing. So it, some uh, scholars said that in Myanmar, is parola, uh, Myanmar, is, in Myanmar there is a parallel state building, and then they may lead to the scenario like Syria. But I would like to say, this parallel state building is a very healthy, very healthy, because he arose, he didn't get this kind of chance to practice the federal principle. Now they are doing, they practicing the federal principle as well as negotiating and discussing in between the actors. So that is a political development. So those are all highlighted the, the joint political statements released on the 31st January this year. This is very, very important document. There is a detailed uh, framework for how we're going to move forward to build the federal democracy nation. And then the financial sectors, the Ministry of the, uh, Finance and Planning, that ministry developed very creative and innovative revenue flows for the uh, for the NUG and for this revolution. On the other hand, the people and then the other concerned ministry and the participation of the ERO, the military is now struggling for this, struggling for the financial survival. You may notice about the inflation, 300% inflation these days, and also and the, the military contract is uh, losing the hard currency so this sort of thing so military political uh, financial mm -hmm. uh, all these three aspects the military regime is struggling today and that is why Myanmar people are now saying that we are returning home we are coming back our home no one can stop so that is the slogan that Myanmar people are saying to mm. Thank you. I think we're, we're getting close to the end of our time, but I think we've got time for one more question which has come in. And Sophia, I might ask you to, to answer this one. And it's um, pointing out that, you know, focusing on one particular ethnic group isn't always particularly helpful. And the question that's being asked is, you know, how could we steer the conversation in every discussion to be more constructive and productive towards building a platform for federalism? So bringing in all the different ethnic communities rather than focusing on, on, on the differences. Would you have any thoughts on that? Well, I actually would say it's also probably the um the role of these um international media as well, because the the issues in Myanmar is like like I think one particular ethnic, like let's say, like you know, like um Rohingya issue, and let's say that probably the like because of what actually happened in, in to in Rohingya ethnic groups or like that probably international community they are more interested in what actually happened to that group. But what he wanted uh the what how we are going to create the constructive and more meaningful the whole discussion is also probably a part of the um the also like you know like NUGs or other but I think even in the minister, she mentioned that one, uh, she has been asked about the Rohingya sufferings and oppression. She said, particularly Rohingya is not only one ethnic minority group who is suffering the, the oppression by the military, but also other ethnic minority groups in Myanmar also suffering for decades. And as we are aware, aware of that, but how we are going to bring these uh, federalisms and the inclusivity and inclusive and unity is also very big important questions and I think the media and the agency and the international community as well as like people including myself has the responsibility to play a big role whoever had the power to, uh, to, uh, to speak out any platform like you know, like uh, bringing up all the ethnic minority and also the, because of the legacies of these are uh, what actually happened in my country is like people uh, stay um, um, the bited even within like, you know, different 
different groups like, oh, my issue is more important than other issue and not really representing as Myanmar as a, not a nation, but also like people wanted to highlight it, for example, when we go to a advocacy trade to different uh, government body or international community, different group highlighted their own group suffering instead of Myanmar. Myanmar. So that the reason behind is because of we do not have these these like national separate or national identity. You know what I mean? Like because of oh these my ethnic group suffering my this it rather than my country. So um going back to these like repeating like Dr. Tuan Shui said and also Dr. Zaman said the national unity, national identity, not rather than focusing on one particular identity is very important. I think at this stage and we are repeating the country and we are like you know starting from the beginning and so we need to come out uh, how we are going to um uh, you know like work and work together and how we are going to imagine a society and one identity group rather than oh like one single group and like that so i think we could learn a lot of example from the even asia like indonesia they had done a lot quite well in terms of coming out because of different ethnic groups they had like multiple like ethnic groups but they are proud to say we are indonesian rather they do not need to say oh i am my ethnic group they do not need to represent but in my country suddenly and very unfortunately people they own they stay free like my ethnic groups and my identity so i think going moving forward what we need to do is in order to have very constructive and federalism and also nation bending and national identity and unity and inclusivity, these are all very important. And I I think and UG as well as civil society, a civil society which I need a lot of media as well as like activists, individuals all have a, a, a role to play in that. And we had to have this national identity rather than one single group identity. Then of course, we will have the better futures and inclusivities. And that's all we, we are fighting for because so we do not have this national unity, in, I think. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Dr. Tuvang Shui, um, do you have any final remarks you'd like to make before I close this session? Uh, thank you, Nicholas. So my final uh, comment is Nima revolution is moving very very fast and then the, a lot of progress in various dimensions and then you can see the media in these days regarding the over 70 percent of territories under control of the NUC and ERAs and although SAC the military conduct is trying to organize an election as an exist for him but I don't think so that, were, that they can make it because of the military advancements is will make uh, will make the international community perception change to what the other different directions, especially the neighboring countries. And also the NUC and airlines already expressed their political loneliness. And then that Roman already included about the uh, drafting the constitution, referendum, and then the election. So the way we want <coughs> to do the sustainable peace, the election in our political roadmap is the answer. The the NU the, the military allies, uh, military fronter election is not the answer for the for people of Myanmar. It's not the answer for the regional community, not the answer for the global. Thank you. Thank you. Well, it was great to have um, have you both uh, speaking tonight. And it was also, I must say, wonderful to have uh, Zin Marang uh, visiting Australia, her first visit in three years. And I hope very much it won't be another three years um, before we see her back here again, because we'd very much like to welcome her here once more and to meet with her. So everybody, thank you very much for joining us this evening. And I look forward to um, seeing you all again in a month's time for our next webinar. Thank you.